You are listening to Talking Africa, the podcast that gets behind all the news from the continent, brought to you by the Africa Report. I'm Patrick Smith, and welcome to the pod. Go to our site, theafricareport.com, to read all about the health, political and economic effects of the pandemic and the many other developments happening across the continent. This week, we're privileged to have Dr. Machidiso Mweti, Director of the World Health Organization's Regional Office in Africa. Privileged because she must be one of the busiest doctors on the planet, working on the coordination of the public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic with 54 governments and countless non-governmental organizations. Dr. Mweti explains the best way that communities can protect themselves against the virus and what public health interventions are most effective and whether the pandemic will be a wake-up call for governments to step up social investment in public health and education. She also tells us how the WHO is faring at this moment of crisis in the international system. But first I asked Dr Mweti about the pace of transmission of the virus across Africa and whether initial hopes that the continent would fare better than Asia and Europe were proving justified. I think what we are seeing is um, it's progressing in Africa. Yes. Definitely. And, and we are seeing more and more community transmission in, in more and more countries. And right. that's, I think, uh, uh, an indicator of risk. Because once you start going beyond clusters where you can clearly see it was so and so, they infected these ones who infected these, and people are being infected and you've no idea by whom, where, then that means that the risk is greater. So at the moment, I think we've got about 30 countries now. So in the, our region looks after 47 countries, Sub-Saharan Africa plus Algeria. Right. And in about 30 of these, we have community transmission. So that I think the risk is there. The, the spread, the, the speed of uh, the growth of the pandemic is not acceleration everywhere. So we have steady growth, continuing growth all over the region, especially in these countries where there is community spread. We've got very accelerated growth in South Africa, which at the moment is accounting for about 60% of the new cases. So in, in a sense, South Africa is a country which is now seeing, after having had imported cases some, some months ago, really um, rapid spread in a few places, in the biggest urban areas, I would say, in the Western Cape, in Gauteng, around Joburg, and also in the Eastern Cape. Um, then we have a number of other countries where the, the spread has speeded up, and this primarily is around the easing of um, those lockdown measures that were put in place. So a country like Mauritania, well, okay, that's a country without a very big population, but for weeks, they had very few cases when they'd done the lockdown, uh, when people were not moving, um, either outside or in between cities. And then when they eased some of this in the capital city, especially, they're seeing now an exponential growth. Right. Um, then there are other countries like, uh, well, Nigeria, of course, is another one where there continues to be rapid growth, not at the speed of South Africa, we don't think, and the numbers are not the same. Algeria has had, Algeria was the first country to be, to have a case in our region, and it spread pretty rapidly there from clusters and became a community spread. And they had a bit of a struggle to bring it under control, but in the last few weeks, they started to see every week a reduction in, in the number of new cases. And then other countries, um, Ghana, have seen a quite significant number of cases, but there again, the, the rate of growth has slowed down. So what we think is that we will continue to see this, this uh, pandemic unfold in Africa 
to a degree until we, we start having a, a vaccine in place, in my view. We will continue to see spikes in countries now and again, and these will very much be related to interventions, particularly as countries uh, ma manage the process of opening up their economies, and hopefully as they see the spikes in, in cases being sustained for a bit, take additional action to, to close down again uh, yeah, in the countries. We have a number of countries that, that have really managed to keep the numbers relatively low. So those include um, Uganda, which um, has a, a quite good uh, public health infrastructure. It's one of the countries that has good uh, high level institutions, laboratories, as well as a well-established um, decentralized surveillance system for, for public health matters. So they managed to keep their cases down. They have very much seen an increase of mainly imported cases through truck drivers who are bringing goods from various countries. And um, they, they triggered a, a process with, with these countries of uh, working together across borders to, to manage the situation. Then countries like Seychelles had virtually no cases for quite a few weeks. And then as they were opening up their economy, had uh, a boat bring in some people to work in the fishing industry and 64 out of those that came in at the same time were infected. And, and the same for Mauritius. Uh, countries like Botswana and Namibia also have managed to keep their numbers down um, to below uh, 400. Um, yeah, so we, we, we've had, it, it's a very diverse picture. The bigger countries, the more populated countries, the DRC, Nigeria, South Africa, have to some extent driven the increase in cases. And then we've had some countries that have had a spike in cases, some community spread, and have managed to bring it down, like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Senegal. Um, and then some countries that have managed to keep the cases really very low, mainly imported cases or clusters. And then now that they, they are opening up their, their economies, people are moving around more, see the spikes of cases. And uh, we think that this has given the opportunity for these countries to build up the public health capacities that they need then to trace contact, find the cases, trace the contacts, and then isolate them to, to manage the situation. Can you draw any conclusions, or can researchers at the WHO draw any conclusions from the the concentration of cases at the extremities of Africa. There do seem to be a lot more cases in, in South Africa, as you say, particularly in the Western Cape, and then these cases in Algeria. And I know Egypt is not, I think, part of your zone, but there have been mm -hmm. a lot of cases in Egypt too. Is there anything about the climate, the geography, even the demographics of those countries that indicate they're going to take uh, a heavier hit from the from the pandemic, or that it's too early to draw conclusions. Um, yeah, I, I think you know the, the cases were imported by travelers right. mainly from European countries. Right. So we've been in countries that have quite intense, uh, if you like, interaction traffic with Europe. Um, this so the the ones from. Algeria, it was imported from France. In South Africa, it was some people who went skiing in the Italian Alps were the first cases that came back home with and brought the, the disease. And then these are countries with several features, I think sort of urbanization in both uh, South Africa and, and in Algeria, and it really started to grow in urban areas. There are also countries where there's a, a certain level of, um, if you like, mobility of people. So in terms of their economic situation, these are both middle income countries where you have lots of people who are able to travel in different ways, including people being able to travel by cars. The road networks are good in these countries. People are able to travel a lot. And then it's concentrated very much in urban areas. So in South Africa, of course, it's spread to all the, all the regions and it, it's spread quite widely in, in Algeria too. But the largest numbers of cases tend to be in, 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 um, in urban areas. And in South Africa, what's happening now is 
the spread from you know, the type of person who can go skiing in the Italian Alps is not an average South African. Right. And then it has now spread into the lower income um, areas, so the townships and the lower socioeconomic areas where there's uh, more crowded conditions um, and where people are using public transport a lot in quite crowded conditions as well. So, you know, it's done that transition from the group who first brought it in to now the, the, the more risky and vulnerable context where the majority of the people are living. And as you know, I mean, in a way that it, uh, South Africa is very similar to the situation in some of the Western countries, in the US, the, the, that issue that is being spoken about very uh, intensely now about the fact that we've seen a concentration among uh, black people, lower, socioeconomic income people who already have in their living conditions, riskier situations, et cetera. And, and I think it's similar, at least in South Africa. The, the, the population structure, well, I mean, now speaking more broadly about the region, of course, we do have a younger population in, in, uh, in the African region. Right. And uh, we, we, are, we are hearing evidence, I guess it needs to be more generally confirmed that people below the age of 20 are less likely to become infected than people who are older. And, and of course, if that's the case, that could be one of the factors that's, that's uh, bringing about the situation that we are seeing in, in African countries. We've been very concerned about South Africa because it has a young population, yes, but it also has a high prevalence of HIV which might then make people who are immune compromised, HIV positive, not yet on treatment, more vulnerable to getting uh, not only infected, but seriously ill. So these are things that we still need to understand. The, the influence of the temperature, humidity, we've, we've heard, uh, uh, if you like, uh, speculation, needing confirmation that in very humid, uh, environments, the, the droplets are not able to travel as far as they can when it's drier and then perhaps that limits the circulation of the virus. So we need, we need to continue to, to look for evidence to understand this pattern. You, you mentioned... Go on. No, carry on. Um, I, I said you, you mentioned HIV infections there. Um, I wondered, could I broaden that out to, to get your sense, um, because I know your one of one of your signal programs was this um, universal health health coverage pro program right mm -hmm. across Africa. What so far has been the effects of the um, uh, concentration on 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 trying to stop the pandemic in its tracks in Africa on all the other programs the the anti-malarial program, the anti-HIV programs, uh, the anti-TB programs, uh, because I know some of the big foundations have just stopped funding those or said they're going to move all their resources into the pandemic. How are you trying mm. to balance those, those two imperatives? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very concerned by the signs already, and, and it started to happen pretty quickly, that um, access to essential services for some of these priority health problems in the region has the, the pandemic has had uh, an impact already. Um, you know, so services for immunization of children, for example, uh, and it's simply that, first of all, people weren't allowed to move. So to get to the health facility was difficult. And then secondly, um, the health workers were also very wary and concerned because the has been huge problems with having access to PPE sufficient for, for everybody in the region. And also the, the public were, were nervous, afraid where they could be mobile about possibly being infected because they go to, uh, to, to a health facility. So services like immunization have been uh, disrupted significantly. We've got data indicating that about one and a half million children have missed their first dose of the measles containing vaccine in routine services in the first quarter of, of this year as compared to last year. So that's huge in, in terms of an impact. 
There have also been significant drops in women being able to go for antenatal.